This week on Surfing the Nash Tsunami. Now that we accumulate more and more results from different trials and different molecules, we really start understanding the complexity of these issues. All these new data that accumulate start unraveling the complexities of this disease, which are either due of the, the complexity of the pathogenesis or to the imperfection of the tools we have to measure them. Last weekend, over 200 NASH stakeholders gathered in person at Deer Valley, Utah, and virtually, for the fifth NASH TAG conference. Joined hepatology researcher and NASH TAG co-director Dr. Stephen Harrison, liver wellness advocate Louise Campbell, Global Liver Institute president and CEO Donna Cryer, and pricing and forecasting guru Roger Green, along with this week's guest, hepatology researcher and NASH TAG co-director Professor Vlad Ratziu, as they discuss lessons and takeaways from NASH TAG 2021 on the Surfing the NASH Tsunami podcast. For everyone with an interest in NASH, or more broadly, fatty liver disease, Surf's Up, Season 2, Episode 15 of Surfing the NASH Tsunami. Our wrap-up episode for NASH Tag 2021 starts now. So, NASH Tag wrapped up Saturday night, as we said on Sunday, and even those who spent Sunday skiing packed up and went home. I'm assuming Naeem did not get injured because I haven't heard about him not getting home yet. People went home with lots to think about, lots of ways to make positive change in the fatty liver world, maybe even occasionally following a hero of Donna's and mine make good trouble. And I speak for everyone involved in our meeting when I say that program was something special. On the one hand, this is our usual Monday recording session and time, and on the other hand, it's our NASH Tag wrap-up. Stephen's home from the conference in the slopes, and Stephen, what was your best memory of Utah? Oh, my best <laughs> <laughs> Y'all are going to laugh at this. But so Brent Tetry, who has been my mentor for 18 years and was really instrumental in getting me into fatty liver when I was a, a liver transplant fellow with them in 2002, took me skiing on Saturday. And he happened to have his daughter, who is a, a resident at Stanford doing a, a combined peds anesthesia residency. She is a world-class skier. And they decided that they, they wanted to take me on runs I'd never been on before. To include a bowl, a double black that went, you know, there's down and then there's inverted. This was more like inverted and it had moguls on it. I was told that that I was well prepared for this. They had seen me ski a, a groomed black diamond and that this would be no no big deal. And so uh, Brent skied on ahead and Laura smartly decided to stay behind me. And as I traversed this hill, I think anxiety took over scared, whatever you want to call it. But my head decided to keep going and my skis stayed in the same place. And I tomahawked into a, mo a mogul. And, and because the slope was inverted, I continued to, you know, move down the hill at a rapid pace with leaving a yard sale behind me of a pole over here, a pole over there, a ski over here. <laughs> and poor Laura was going behind, picking up all these pieces and and and, <laughs> and bringing them down. And, and it took, uh, I would say, a good hour for me to get down that hill. But we, we did eventually. And, and Laura was such a, a great uh, trooper to to coach me through that. But that was my most memorable event from the whole trip to uh, to Nashtag. But it didn't assuage my my love of skiing, and I will continue to go back. They say if you don't fall over, you're not trying hard enough. And mm -hmm. if you're not trying hard enough, you're not learning. And they say that failure is really the only way to learn. So, you know. Absolutely. And a great motivator. But so, Stephen, all I want to know is, did Laura succeed in making a masterpiece out of those broken pieces? Uh, she's working on it. I'm a work in progress. A masterpiece in progress, as it were. To be jettisoned down a hill. Some of you physicians, my stepson uh, is, is an ENT surgeon, and, and he's up in Ithaca, and, and he brings out this chainsaw for the 90 acres of their property. And I'm like, you, you make your living off your hands. How, how are you handling a, a chainsaw? I just, it just, I can't even contemplate it. It, 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 it just ruins my nerves. I have to walk away. So I'm like, you all are so precious to me. I, I can't, my heart can't take it. <laughs> I would say that, that the, there was clearly the benefit of a helmet at that moment because I would have eaten, uh, and, and my mask, because I would have eaten snow and it would have gone in my eye, eyeballs and everything else because I, I was full on face plant. Those were all necessities. Okay, audience, I asked for a story 
story about the meeting. And boy, did we get a story about the meeting. Stephen, you always deliver more than your money's worth. Thank you for that. So, I did it just for the podcast, by the way. I mean, just to the sacrifices I make. Thank you for taking one in for the team. So moving forward, Louise is back as well, having done her 1,500 jabs, I guess, today uh, at the Excel Center. And Donna was gracious enough to stay with us one more time to finish what she started. And we have hopes that we'll have two guests today, each with time constraints and at least one with problems figuring out how to get his computer into the system. So I'm not even going to announce who they are. They'll show up and I'll tell you who's here. Uh, they can either be the masked singer or they can be themselves. So for the most part, we're going to treat this as a Nashtag event, not a usual podcast in terms of using different groundbreakers and all that. Except that at the back end of this episode, after we say goodbye to our guests, I will fill you in a little bit on some business activities of Surfing Nash and some of the future things we're going to be working on over the next month or two. To start, though, for the four of us, because we're who's here right now, um, let's use a Nashtag related icebreaker. Now that we've each had a couple of days to reflect, what do you think is likely to be the most important enduring change. It can be what people think, what people know, or how people act. I don't care. But the most important enduring change likely to have come out of that meeting. Brave one, go first. I will look forward to several more ambassadors for our Beyond the Biopsy program, which I submit as a slightly more productive name than the cult for utilizing non-invasive diagnostics. And so I'm so glad that everybody put their hands up. I, I noted them all, and they will all be contacted to, to speak on the Global Liver Institute Beyond the Biopsy campaign. Donna, it is a tight knit group. Yes, and so puns will be welcome. That's what social media is for. But we'll mm -hmm. take you all as you are. Well, that, that was that was your contribution, right, Stephen? No, I will. Uh, I'll add to that. So, in the vein of non-invasive tests, Rohit made a very compelling argument that MRI PDFF is here to stay as as a marker of measuring therapeutic benefit to drugs in which liver fat moves. So, where you have metabolic drugs that move PDFF, I think he made a compelling argument that we have enough data now to identify a degree of change in PDFF correlating with NASH resolution and uh, improvement in the NAFLD activity score. He was very cautious in making claims relative to fibrosis benefit because I think that does need a bit more vetting. But he also showed data that with the right magnitude of effect change in PDFF, that also then tends to link to fibrosis. And so I think MRI PDFF PDFF, and I'm going to defend Rohit. I'm also a big proponent of that, um, of PDFF as a marker of therapeutic efficacy in the right mechanism. It doesn't work for all mechanisms, but when you do see it move, it moves a certain percentage, whether it's 30%, 50 or 70, that is linking to benefit. What we still need to know is it's linked to long-term benefit, but at least we can use that to say our patients are getting better, and that's going to be helpful to the payer. You know, at the end of the day, we put a patient on a drug, we treat them for a period of time, we repeat the imaging, they're getting better. Okay, well, that's a response that I think would allow them to continue to stay on drug. So I would say also equally important to that, I was impressed by data that Mike Charlton presented on the importance of assessing nutrition. And in the same vein, it struck me during the meeting that in the setting of this pandemic, and this relates to the placebo response rate, the compelling argument Mike made that maybe the variability in placebo response is linked to maybe not so obvious clinical changes in lifestyle modification. What we've seen unexpectedly with the pandemic is people are, are not modifying their lifestyle. In fact, they're less active. They've tended to gain weight, if anything. And that's going to have a stability impact on placebo response. So trials that are enrolling in the middle of the pandemic, I, I'm going to predict now that we will see lower placebo response rates. And Stephen, building on that, I would note the um, you know increase in alcohol use as well. And, and the microbiome changes of alcohol too, I thought was really impressive data. And so as both comfort eating and, and alcohol use are, are increasing or have increased for a portion of people during the pandemic, that will affect the trial background. I'm thinking of the slide that was shown on the Alto Brewery, you know, that that, <laughs> that there are some people, Klebsiella, I think, was the, the bacteria that was linked to, to the development of, of alcohol. So your point is well taken as well. So can I just ask on that point you raised there about it not affecting the placebo in such a way, if it affects it the way you suspect that you don't see the same drop, do we then say the drugs are more effective than they actually are? And do we take it to the positive because at the moment if the placebo moves too much we say it's the unpredictability of the placebo group and we use it as a negative but if what you're suggesting is that they've changed their diet for the negative they're less active so they're not going to drop that weight in fact they'll go the opposite way it strengthens the results of the medication 
So it sways it the opposite way. So, Louise, your exact comment came up on a discussion I had earlier today where I made the comment that I made and the re response was exactly yours. So let me uh, frame my thoughts on that in, in the opposite way. So if what if what's happening in placebo is that we're getting the real effect of placebo, for instance, then what's happening in the drug group is we're only seeing the effect of the drug group, right? Because ideally, if you're getting benefit from lifestyle modification, not only would that enhance the placebo response, but it should enhance your drug IP response. You don't, you don't change the delta, except you're only getting reality of what's happening to the drug group relative to a baseline placebo. So I think at the end of the day, it just makes it a truer assessment of what you're actually likely to see from just drug alone. The thought I had, Louise, listening to your question, is that if we standardize around better behavior on diet and drinking and microbiome, placebo response will go up. Overall, patient success will go up. Stephen's right. You'll get a truer read of what the drug is, but you'll get also a truer understanding of exactly how much benefit we can bring to how many patients. And at the end of the day, my belief is the more benefit we can prove that we bring to more patients, no matter how we do it, the more patients will get into therapy, the more uh, physicians will refer folks in when they should be or learn how to do some of this themselves. And it'll have a dramatically positive effect on liver health. It may make the drug trial issue a little naughtier, but but for the overall health, I think it's got to be much, much better. Just reflecting back, Louise, if you look at the regenerate and the resolvent data, so this is OCA and elafibronor, the fibrosis benefit of both drugs were exactly the same or within one percentage point of each other. But the difference and the reason why one met its subpart H approvable endpoint and the other didn't was the placebo response rate. So again, I think where we're able to stabilize that out and, and diet and lifestyle are not the whole story there. I think we've learned that the pathologist is important as well because of intra and intra observer variability and the actual quality of the liver tissue, the size, the width, the number of fragments, all that plays in the way it's stained. You want to have uniform staining. We've learned all these things through trial and error more error, right? Again, you learn more from failure than success. So we've torn apart the failures and try to tease out what might have been done differently and how we could improve. And one of those is simply preparing the biopsies in a uniform way, ensuring we have the adequate size, ensuring that the pathologist that we use is experienced and has very good intra-observer variability, the way that we read them as well. But at the end of the day, there is a measure of placebo response that is likely enhanced by, by the lifestyle, you know, both diet and exercise. And I think Mike Charlton did a great job of, uh, of working through that and the role that diet plays. Our other guest, Vlad Rothschild. Good, good evening, Vlad. Good evening, everyone. Vlad, we were just kicking around the, the question that goes, what do, you, what do people think the most enduring change to come out of the meeting will be? And uh, Donna suggested beyond the biopsy. I, I, I suggested that the most enduring change certainly was, Vlad, your, your presentation. And I fully embrace uh, you and everyone who, who raised their hand in an endorsement uh, of your presentation to become ambassadors for our Beyond the Biopsy campaign. So I, I accept your uh, nomination and uh, look forward to putting you to work. Uh, thank you. The, the most uh, enduring thing uh, will be the fact that uh, an hashtag is now the, the, the prime place to discuss about drug development in NASH. And, uh, and I hope we can really keep this blend uh, of uh, academic discussions together with involvement from the sponsors so that it's still an academic meeting without getting into commercial side. And I, I'm very happy that we were able to avoid that, I believe, this year as well. So this is, I think it's the fifth time we had NASHTAG and it clearly, we're now heading for a decade of NASHTAG for celebrating number 10 and the second half of the decade. And I hope we'll get there. And I, I believe that it is a very strong message that despite the problems this year, there was almost the same interest in this meeting from our colleagues in research and development, from our colleagues from uh, the different uh, pharma companies, from the public, from the researchers in the field for this meeting. So that uh, that makes me really very happy. That's that's good. Louise, what you got in, in the enduring change category? I agree with what Donna and Vlad have said and Stephen earlier, that I think it is about opening up that discussion on now really pushing beyond the biopsy into the 
future with that and strengthening non-invasive tests or combinations of non-invasive tests. Uh, and we have the high priestess and the high priest of the Beyond the Biopsy cult, newly um, <laughs> newly crowned. But the other um, one that I was really interested in was the concept of the platform trials and how they could offer different streaming. And I thought that was quite interesting. Um, so that'll be the pearl coming up in 2023, I think, when they release that. So it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. And that's quite exciting. If, if I can add, we always tried to have a session on innovative trial design or, or improving trial design. What can you do, do to make trials different, more efficient, better? And I'm happy that we could have this this year again and we'll have to find new ideas for next year. But this also is a distinctive feature of the meeting. Uh, really trying to discuss at a very high level about drug development in all the valences, in all the understandings of the concept. And that includes trial design. And I'm happy you enjoyed that session. I think my takeaway was that this being the third of these I've been to, the first two felt like they were elements but it didn't feel like there was a compound, if you will. Here, I thought there was a tremendous blend between multiple elements that kind of pay each other off. PDFF matters, for example, Stephen. PDFF matters more because we have drugs that are going to do a really good job of defatting the liver and are believed to affect fibrosis also. So therefore, that becomes a test that is a lot more germane in the presence of some of the drugs that are in development. The placebo issue, uh, well, uh, you know, what Mike was saying about diet, I think becomes important generally. But in terms of some of the recent findings about microbiome, all this becomes more important in part as a way to balance clinical trials, but in part as a way to, to be therapeutic. And I agree. I thought the session on platform trials and in general, the questions about trial conduct make a lot more sense in the context of having gotten to a place where there are good drugs in development and where we know a little more at least and have, have a lot more hypotheses we can test about how to track and how to engage it better. My enduring take was that things may start to gel better and be more integrated. I mean, one of the things I said to Stephen after a couple of the presentations in 2020 was that it struck me that I was having a hard time getting the feel for what the dynamic of the disease was or the dynamic of the direction of integrated treatment was. I thought it was a lot clearer this year. I thought everything just was better woven because we know a lot more. That, that's a real outsider perspective. You know, and to the, to the point of innovation and, and uh, focus on, on trial design, I really appreciate it. And I, I said this on an earlier podcast of the humility of the approach of, of the field in rethinking every aspect from, you know, your presentations brought on the basic science and the mice models to the various genetic, you know, factors and the microbiome and the other omics, you know, and each aspect of what may be barriers to high quality trials, you know, for drugs in as monotherapy in combination and the co-development of the diagnostics alongside them. And so I really appreciate that how how thoughtful each aspect was analyzed and, and touched upon um, across the various presentations um, throughout the conference. I want to just see if we can dive into a couple of specific questions and what do we think the most important and best things. We've kind of been there on the diagnostics already. Is there anything we want, else we want to say about about that. I mean, Stephen, you went in that, I think, pretty eloquently. Any other thoughts about that subject? I was just going to follow up on what Donna said there. I thought the blend was really nicely done because what I was able to take away was a way that I can see this in the practical real world setting, not just as a clinical scientific, but because we moved to non-invasive, because there, there's a stronger ability to show, I can actually see down the line the actual ability to put this in at a patient and public level. And I think that's a really, really nice and delicate blend in the vast range from the medications that we saw and the session. So I really like that part. And I thought that was extremely well done. Yeah. And kudos to Stephen and to Vlad and obviously to, to Michael and to Rohit as well. Um, what did we learn about medications that was either new or in the context of everything else starts to look different? You know, th this was really the first place where data that came out in 2020 and press releases and abstracts and in papers was never really brought together collectively and presented and then discussed with appropriate rebuttals where necessary. And I think we saw that. So I think it's more of a coalescence of what transpired over the past 15 months that had never been able to be discussed in an open format at the same time. So whether it's an FXR, whether it's a PAN-PPAR, whether it's a THR beta, an FGF21, an FGF19, FASTEN inhibitor, all that was presented and literally one after the other format. And so it really just kind of set the stage for all the advances that have happened across multiple different mechanisms and, and showed just the, the light years we've come from where we were in originally investigating some of these therapies. And we're really beginning to 
as we begin to unravel the mysteries of NASH pathogenesis, those are now being applied to mechanistic drugs that target those mechanisms. And I think it's having a positive impact. And that's why our non-invasive tests are beginning to, to show up in a positive way as well. So not sure we learned anything new. We just coalesced it into a very understandable format and presented it all within 24 hours. I would add simply that um, it's very important to have a counter view to what the raw results of a study can show and have an, another expert discussing the limitations of the results, what are the things that can be interpreted differently. And I think this is the reason of being of the first part of NASHTAG, which we always start with, which is those presentations and then what we call a rebuttal from a, a different expert. And you really don't find that in other meetings. Those are complex situations. You can't take results at face value. So that's why it's very helpful to have this other interpretation of the data. Another thing that became really very interesting is that now that we accumulate more and more results from different trials and different molecules, we really start understanding the complexity of these issues, which are sometimes puzzling. So we discussed this year about drugs that have fantastic efficacy in getting rid of steatohepatitis, but have no sizable impact on improving fibrosis. We discussed about other drugs that have very strong strong effect on, say, surrogates like PDFF and that have a mode of action that has been clearly established, FXR agonist, as being successful histologically, and yet they have no good histological results. We've seen results of drugs that improve histology without reducing liver fat. So all these new data that accumulate start unraveling the complexities of this disease, which are either due of the, the complexity of the pathogenesis or to the imperfection of the tools we have to measure them. So what we learned now is to discover more and more aspects or depths in this whole process that we haven't anticipated. And in order to make something out of this, you need to have different experts discussing, providing data. What you have shown on Cella Delpar is uh, very useful. In, in fact, it's, it's a very useful, even for someone who follows the field very closely like me, a very useful rendition of all the, the results and putting them in perspective and, and chronologically explaining how they work. Because otherwise you're lost. So having the opportunity in a meeting like this to have someone like Harrison that was involved with the study explaining this to you from A to Z for people who are really interested in that is, is a great opportunity. This wasn't presented as such until NASHTAG, right? Even at ASLD you haven't detailed what happened with the histology and how the committee was formed and what they analyzed, what the results were. So that that's that's a, a big uh, opportunity for someone to, to be able to listen to that. But really what I take away, things are so much more complex than they look and here are examples that go all in different directions that I cited. It is fascinating. So I hope there'll come a time where we can we can reconcile these different results and explain why they happened the way they did. To that point of sort of filling in the gaps or making more clear or transparent the chronology and, and activities that, that sort of might have been, been lost in, in, in the background, you know, it, it was, um, you know, my, my other major takeaway was certainly the, you know, challenge that was, uh, you know, laid before the NASH patient advocacy community and, and having talked with several of the advocates this this morning, you know, we heard the challenge, we will rise to the challenge and, and we will challenge you all right back. It's clear to me that uh, a lot of the activities that have happened from the advocacy side with regulators, with legislators, with CDC, with several of you individually, um, or with other medical societies and organizations, isn't as, as transparent or visible to you all as um, I thought or hoped it had been. And so, you know, we will absolutely be making sure that uh, all of you not only are on our NASH News subscribers list, but have, you know, individual updates, our International NASH Day activities and other areas of collaboration. I'll also challenge you that if uh, we all want uh, sort of uh, AIDS or breast cancer level advocacy, that we need to have um, AIDS and breast cancer their level investment in, in in advocacy. And so while I checked my subscribers list and found all your names, I, I didn't find all your names on 
my uh, donor list. So um, we can we can certainly solve that. And and the same for you know National Knowledge and the Fatty Liver Foundation. We also could utilize your your skills in, in grant writing uh, as we have been successful in in various policy momentum to have chronic disease you know grants available at CDC and and other foundations and organizations of which we have raised the awareness of of uh, the issues and the need and the gaps in, in Nash but I believe uh, could use some of your uh, assistance and expertise and amplification in building the capacity um, of uh, the advocacy community to meet Meet those needs so that we can match your excellent uh, scientific advancement with uh, parallel advancements in payer advocacy, community uh, advocacy, policy, and, and, and other areas. So I, I meet your challenge and I, and I challenge you all right back to partner with us to, um, you know, to meet the, the needs that we've all identify. Yeah, if I can add, I think one step we can take. So Stephen, we have to think about this in, in the direction Donna is mentioning. I think it'll be time next year to have a, at least one presentation from, from a patient or a patient advocate to understand how patients feel about these trials, particularly when you are assigned to a placebo arm for five years or when you have been through a trial that ended up being negative and you've been through everything that a trial requested, liver biopsy once, twice, all the visits, and you end up, you, you find out it's negative. How do you feel if you personally feel or have been shown that you improved despite an overall negative trial? Because there is a response rate, right? In these trials, it's not 0%. Some people do improve. And it's not just all always about sampling variability or chance. So it, it can very well be that some people genuinely improve, but not enough above placebo to say that the trial is positive. And then how do you feel when that drug is taken away from you and it stopped, uh, the development is stopped? So I think the patient perspective on these trials could be interesting because we assume that everybody will consent or at least that once they consent, there's no more question about anything from the patient perspective and he'll go through all the way through the five years of the phase three trial. But uh, it might be more complex than that. I think we should have a little one talk at least on that uh, from someone who experienced those trials. Well, that's a really great topic. We do have some new information on that. You know, some of you know, I sit on the executive committee of the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative, on, on which there's representation from FDA and EMA uh, and others who are looking globally at, um, you know, the improvement of the clinical research best practices. And so at the invitation of former CMS and FDA Administrator Mark McClellan, I've been the patient member now in my second term on that executive committee. And so there's both an advocacy view on, on, on that issue of patient response and reaction and engagement in clinical trials and in NASH clinical trials. And we do want to draw some of that um, as GLI is, is forming our patient-focused drug development meeting. And certainly we'll ask for everyone's input on how we structure the questionnaires about that. But then, yes, on the individual NASH patient experience, which you know varies because, as you all have pointed out, uh, NASH patients are a very heterogeneous population. That's as true you know, genetically and uh, phenotypically as it is culturally and, and economically and in their risk tolerance and preferences and, and choices and, and how they select and participate in trials. So I think from a variety of viewpoints, you know, we'd be happy to integrate that information. That was great. And I think that's that's a really exciting and promising path forward. A lot of, I'm glad you mentioned it. If you were an investor, what would you take out of this meeting for encouragement? And how might you lay bets differently coming out of the meeting than you did going in either in terms of how much you bet or what you betted on? Just very simply, th this NASH tag out of all the five that we've done, has been the most promising relative to drugs that are being developed in the field of NASH. You know, I think 2019 was kind of the low water mark. 2020 was COVID. We continued to enroll NASH clinical trials, and we saw a lot of press related to some of the early trial results across a broad range of mechanism of action. We even saw our first couple combo trial data come in. From a drug development perspective, as an investor, it's been the best year. And it's only going to get better. The investors are like everyone else. They, they always look for additional information, for clarifying things, for interpretation of the data from the leaders in the field. And I think it's a great opportunity to have access to all of these in a single place at a single time, engaging in the discussion of these particular topics. So if anything, I think that it's a great place for someone interested in, in, a, in a deeper understanding of the, of the results, the meaning of the results, of what other people think, of contradictory views 
on the or contrasted views on the results. So uh, I, I think that's what the attraction could be for for an investor. Now, of course, you only get the full effect on that if you can attend the meeting physically, because the discussions are not honestly really not the same. If you have to go through a question on a on a notepad and send it virtually, or or just talk to your neighbor uh, sitting next uh, next chair next to you. But I think that would be uh, the main attraction for the investors. Vlad, your absence physically was was noted. And I think that's personified a bit. So again, having you there at the meeting with the other three really adds to that interactive discussion and dialogue. But just to foot stomp what you said about having the sidebar conversations that take place when you're able to be there in person, we had them. We had those sidebar conversations. And so just looking to next year, we do plan on having a full meeting. Will we have a virtual component? Yeah, probably because we had a lot of positive feedback from it. But hopefully we won't have the social restrictions that made us drop down to 70 or so people. You know, it would be great to fill that room and have the sidebar conversations at breaks and in the period of time between sessions where we can grab uh, something to eat or drink and and maybe, uh, you know, do some skiing together and, and have these conversations that are so rich and fruitful and lead to change within our industry. I mean, I don't know how many conversations I've had at the five Nash tags that have led to new and innovative ways of thinking about things that change the field subsequently over the next couple of years. So I think for that reason, not just investors, but folks in pharma that are interested in diving into Nash, it's a great place to come. If you're a patient advocate, it's a great place to come. If you're a physician that takes care of people with Nash, it's a great thing to join on, whether you're hybrid, whether you're virtual or in person. So there's something for everybody at the meeting. There are several side by conversations I know after some presentations I know I would have had and feel the less for it. Uh, there are also, looking back to past years, there is there's some issues. Issues um, that I have moved more with one conversation on a, on a bench in the sunshine outside of the chateau that I was able to move, you know, in months of emails or phone calls or, or other contacts. And so the importance of that meeting, the structure of the meeting, the size of the meeting, who goes to the meeting, it, it is really essential to the field. So I, I don't know if it's underscoring or foot stomping or, or, you know, whatever, emphasizing, doubling down on that, that point you make, but I, I certainly share that thought. So can I just... Um ask and pertaining to Roger's question about do we think that there is enough early consideration given to the endpoint and how you detail it to the patients. A lot of people enjoy the science. A lot of people enjoy the drug discovery. But I genuinely don't get the sense it's not until the very end when it's achieved everything that people actually start to think about the logistics of how it is delivered to patients, how we engage those patients. I remember when Roche launched Pegasus. And it was delivered in a mechanism that was so unlike the trials that we couldn't dose reduce because it wasn't until the very end that they changed the whole concept from the way it was delivered in the trial setting. And I obviously had a patient who immediately on licensing of the drug needed dose reducing in Dubai. And we couldn't do it because they changed the whole mechanism from the trial setting to the non-clinical setting. So I just wondered whether or not putting more knowledge earlier into how are you actually going to bring the patient forum to these medications when you're successful? Or is it too early? because we've seen too many failures. You're absolutely right. I mean, the more the more we could be well-rounded in the way that we approach drug development in NASH, the better we'll be. I mean, bringing patients along is critical and explaining to them how the drug works and the route of administration and the need to be compliant with therapy are all critical. A lot of attention early on in phase 2A is paid toward just understanding does the drug move the needle in any way? And then in phase 2B, it's dose ranging and and what is the efficacy as well as safety. And I think there, all along the way to Donna's point, we should be including the patients, but it really isn't until we get past 2B where we think there's something tangible here. And even there, like we've seen Stellar 3, Stellar 4, Elifibrinor, all go to phase 
three and fail. So I think part of it is is your point about we, we haven't had a lot of drugs that late in development actually make it. Another one that didn't make it is Sinecrivirox. So now we're we're trying to see if there's something with a beta cholic acid that could get approved, but the next one would be resmeterome in the shoot and sometime in 2023. So we have a lot of work to do between now and 2023 to educate the population, educate primary care, disease state awareness. This is the role of these advocacy groups for sure, leading the charge, whether it's focusing on education, focusing on non-invasive testing. It's all critically important. And sometimes I feel like you're at the fair and you're squirting water in this car to see who can get to the top first. But really, we should be squirting water in all the cars and all rise at the same time. Unfortunately, that's that's not been the way it's been in, in drug development for, for NASH. And it wasn't that way in hepatitis C either. Let's walk back and think about when the sponsor starts planning for that to be. It, it, you know, it's been a, a privilege that I've pushed for across the course of my career that it, it used to be and still rarely we'll get someone asking us to recruit for a trial when it's all baked in and done and just, you know, ask people to participate in our poorly designed trial. And now with increasing number of companies, we know we are asked to participate in advisory boards um, across their whole research portfolio and are asked for input as the 2A and 2B trials are, are being developed. And you know we're able to bring in insights and expertise to preferred methods of administration. And we're getting better as, as our organizations mature and are able to provide that information and more in more structured formats and in fuller formats and with greater diversity of patients. But I, I would not ignore the patient role in clinical trial design and development very early on because we increasingly have that expertise and are bringing that and are being asked to uh, apply that expertise. And to the point about the investor confidence, I think we perhaps have an under-recognized role in de-risking the environment for NASH drug development as we show the strength of the advocacy community, as we build a way and education and focus years before we will need, you know, ICER to determine or others, HTAs to determine value assessment and are putting in those uh, patient-centered value framework uh, elements in, in place and trying to do that research or having the conversations with payers. Um, all of that work needs to be done years before it's needed. That's been the toughest method across and they get, you know, engagement and traction and, and investment in so that we can do our job in terms of, you know, creating the surround sound for your research so that, to Lisa's point, when a, a drug, whatever drug it is, is is successfully, you know, approved as it has been, frankly, in India, and now they have a, you know, the national plan in India, we have one that we presented for the for the U.S. We're working with Wilton Part on on, on on Europe. But when a drug is approved, you're going to need all those parts to ensure that it is reimbursed and built into health systems, integrated into EHR, you know, coded correctly, as they seem to in in more you know mature disease areas. We're building them from scratch in 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 liver disease and in hepatology, certainly in NASH. And so, you know, if there's one takeaway that I would want you know people to walk away with, in, in a addition to the optimism around the science is the optimism of advocacy. You know, we are here, Fatty Liver Foundation is here, Nash Knowledge and, and our partners at Easel I, I know, uh, um, Foundation are, are, are here, um, but we need your partnership and we are an essential part of the solution as well. And so, you know, if somebody wanted table thumping, consider the table thump. There were a couple of other things I wanted us to get to and Donna, th thanks, that was great. And um, certainly a response to the recent request for table thumping, I think a powerful one and quite well quite well done. Can I add there's something very short? Uh, one of the issues we'll have to face once a drug is on the market and people start taking it will be what's the best way to keep people on the drug? It is um, a very strange situation where you can't really judge about the efficacy of the drug you're taking. It's not like taking an antihypertensive drug. You forget to take for two or three days. Your, your blood pressure goes up. You can measure it. You have sometimes signs, symptoms. You go back to take the medicine because you're worried and you don't do that again. Here, things change very very slowly without noise the asymptomatic in an asymptomatic way it'll be a challenge to keep people taking the drug knowing that you can only assess the efficacy indirectly 
through serum markers or whatever once a year. And in the meanwhile, there's no really good way to tell people that they keep improving, that the drug keeps working better and better, or that they stay the same, or that it doesn't work. And we'll have to, for the moment, we're not really focused on that, but that will be a challenge, uh, the uptake of the drug in the long term, uh, with the very imperfect tools we have to measure efficacy, and uh, with a very long delay and the asymptomatic nature of the disease. You know, Manal gave it a very good term of anticipatory education. We contrasted it with prednisone, where you get the, you put up with the weight gain and the moon face and the other things, but because you feel so good immediately and you know your symptoms are chronic. And so we do need to educate patients about the importance of the cardiovascular risk reductions or other elements that may be improving that matter in the short, near and long term, and perhaps give them more feedback of some sort, as, as Louise does in, in her program, more frequently, certainly, than once a year if we're going to have people persist on therapy. So that's an absolutely important issue. And I think it's Paul Donner in that one. And I think what we see is that if people have high problems, the more regularly you engage with them and the more regularly we can scan them, the easier it is to keep them on that track. And even if they take it to a couple of steps backwards, it's actually reassuring for them to know that they can actually make that change again. And I think that's what we do see, that people don't always follow the guidelines that um, we set. And what you see is the liver engaged with more fat. But what they are reassured about is when they go back to their better behaviour, that that improves. And to be fair, that is one of the reasons we want to try and make this accessible to everybody and make it as cheaper and cheaper as possible. Because most people should not become liver disease patients. They should be able to manage to prevent becoming a liver disease patient, which a lot of other areas happen. And therefore, we spend our time as clinicians and professionals at the back end with the ones we really, really need to focus on. So brief intervention with fibre scan is not just a diagnostic for diagnostic sake. It's a diagnostic that really motivates change behaviour. And adding that component of brief intervention is an intervention and a potential treatment option in light of no medication currently. And people do get motivated, the same as they do in lots of other disease states where they see and can regularly monitor, like hypertension. If you monitor your blood pressure regularly and you know it's improving, you do stay well motivated. But I think, as Vlad said, it takes such a long time to make changes. But I've seen people go to a fast food diet and clog their liver within three months really badly. And I've seen them do the opposite again by going back to a more healthy lifestyle and defat the liver quite quickly. It's not the same for everybody, but having the ability to have that knowledge has been important to those individuals. I want to note that, Vlad, we're going to invite you to come back for an episode within the next couple of months because uh, Michael Charlton pulled out his Shakespeare and said that your uh, presentation about life without the biopsy should have been titled Not To Be. I want to come back and do a to be or not to be uh, episode at some point in the near future. But we're getting towards an hour, and this is our fifth session on this, and I want to make sure people listen and keep thinking, I think this has been great. And we've actually managed to touch on a bunch of things today that we did not touch on in any of the earlier sessions. Closing question. One thing that you think will be part of NASHTAG 2022, besides a lot more interpersonal interaction on site, that it was not known or available to be a part of 2021? The, the biggest thing for me, Roger, is I'm asking other non-invasive test magnitude of affect changes in response to therapy. One thing that's missing right now is Pro-C3. We don't know the right magnitude of effect change. Same thing with ELF. MRE, I think we more, need more data around what, what's a meaningful change. And all of this data has already been generated. It's just waiting to be mined and presented. And I think we'll have that at EASL AA, and then we'll have novel data presented at NASHTAG next year. So to me, I want to build on what Rohit did with MRI PDFF and broaden that aperture out to other non-invasive tests that we can use for the three different contexts of use, not just diagnosing the at-risk NASH patient or assessing magnitude of effect change, but also more data on how it relates to long-term patient outcomes. Like Maru hinted at and showed with some of the non-invasive tests like FIB4 and NAFL fibrosis score and others, I think we're just going to build on that knowledge and it will be an explosive amount of data, I think, that'll be presented in 2022 NASH Tech. I think you have my offer for an update on how patient advocacy is helping to advance the field. I, I will not let anything stop me from being there. I'm uh, looking forward to more data that describe the heterogeneity of the disease. Uh, do we need to separate 
groups of people with NASH are all the same? Should we all treat them with the same drug or uh, should the drug be targeted to some more homogenous subgroups of patients? And in particular, I would like to see more data on uh, whether the, the genetic polymorphism, which we now have at least four that have been strongly associated with NASH, whether they predict the response to any drug or, or not at all, that uh, that would be something I would be interested in next year. I suppose by NASH tag 2022, I'd like to think that we may have some medication licensed. Um, I don't know how far um, OCA is away from producing the final data that the FDA want. And I suppose we may have a clearer idea of what the standard of care arm will be throughout studies, as they suggested, because that will take some designing with the heterogeneity and of the disease and the phenotypes. So that will be an interesting thought process that goes through that. And, and for me, it was striking that in the last session, we were talking about combined modes of action, combined therapies, and a couple of really further down the pike things. I would love to see where they go in the next year. I suspect the drug companies are going to have to, within a year or two, start making some serious bets about which agents they think will only ever be part of combination therapy. Pfizer's already said that about AACs, for example. And actually, we had this a few weeks ago, right? We talked about the FDA webcast, and Stephen made a strong case for combination is the way to go. And Kitty Yale said, well, I'm a romantic. I kind of hope monotherapy will get it done. I understand why Kitty, given what she does, would say that. But um, we're doing a better job of understanding how adequate monotherapy will be and the degree to which we're going to need combinations to get it done as compared to being able to to isolate patients by the polymorphisms or by genotyping or something and say, if this is what you bring, this is what you take. And maybe monotherapies can provide more benefit that way. Those are questions yet to be seen. As apropos as that question is, uh, a CME just emailed me and said some questions he would like to have answered for next year. Can I mention those? Please. So Please. we heard very little about bariatric surgery and endoscopic options like duodenal resurfacing, duodenal tubes, etc. Number two, it seems to me a critical area for the whole field to tackle is the role of medication-induced weight loss in NASH improvement. Is it enough just to lose weight or do we need drugs to do more? A key example are the GLP-1 agonists. How do we separate the beneficial effects of weight loss versus pharmacological actions or does it really matter? I thought those were very insightful. I think they're great and you reminded me of another point I wanted to make that I didn't, which is are we going to see a bifurcation of interest between some drugs reduce fibrosis and some drugs simply don't allow it to progress further? Manal's really been beating that the last two or three times she's been on the, on the podcast, and I think it was raised in the meeting about semaglutide, and it goes along with the questions you just asked, right? It accentuates the questions Vlad always asks, which is, look at the group that worsened, you know, and, and, and did we minimize the worsening, not necessarily target improvement. All good points. I think the advocates have been in the value that we place on stopping progression and have communicated that to regulators. Another, uh, you know, regulatory, you know, win has been the breakthrough therapy uh, designation for one of the, you know, balloon gastric uh, procedures. And so I think there's much to say on that. And again, I think filling in um, perhaps the pieces of the puzzle that are as, not as visible uh, to members of the, the research community seems to have some value. With that, let me thank everybody. Let me, well, first of all, thank Steve, Vlad for coming on at this late hour, although not as late as it would have been last week. And Stephen and the Nash Tech co-directors for giving us so much access and so much support in being able to cover this event and bring it to people who couldn't be there. You guys have been great. I've already got plans for next year that exceed what we did this year in terms of making it real for people. Well, a year to talk about it. But this has been a fantastic experience for us. And thanks both of you for coming. Donna, thank you for making five out of five. I also think that I th I'm, I'm going to look for your support as we edit conversations out of this, because I think there are ways to tie themes together that are not quite as conventional as the simple topic that will have the effect of giving people a better sense of um, what actually goes on week to week in the space. And I think your help on that would be pretty invaluable. Louise, thank you. Thank you for making four out of five of these. And spending the fifth with the NHS was exactly the right thing to do. That it's a pleasure. Really I'm on a yacht. Um, oh, oh, that's right. You know, for anyone who didn't hear this on earlier podcast. Louise, tell everybody where you are before we go. All because right. I'm working at the Excel and I was working today. The big yacht, which is the Sunborn yacht, puts NHF staff up at a reduced rate. So I am sitting in the, one of the estate rooms with a balcony. Can you turn it around and show us what uh, what it's like here? It's a nice big room, I tell you. Oh, yeah. Well, if we can solve the problems that people keep throwing in the way of Oxford AstraZeneca, it would be great. I, I've taken Oxford AstraZeneca and I haven't had a problem. And we've certainly delivered in the region of 18 million, I think, in the UK, and we really haven't had that many problems. So we'll see where it goes. Well, so next time we discuss this, we'll have Yorn on so we can talk about his friends at BioNTech and what amazing work got done in Mainz and, 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 and American investors and all that. Thank you, everybody, for being part of this. And thank you for everybody.
everybody who's listened. I think so far we've got something in the range of 700 downloads on this meeting. I expect that'll probably double by the time we're done. So um, I think the effort everybody's put in is paid off in terms of keeping people engaged in a meeting they couldn't attend and wanted to be at. And uh, Surfing Nash, this will go live Wednesday night. We'll be back next week on our regular schedule. Listener numbers keep growing. Since we're back to our regular schedule after Nash Tag, this week's news from Surfing Nash covers three questions. One, fantastic listenership numbers and power. It seems boring to keep talking about how many people are listening, but there are more of you show up every week and download every week, and we're really excited and grateful for that. Up until the last month, our biggest weeks were driven by major events. The two biggest weeks in 2020 since we switched to Buzzsprout were Easel and ASLD. Now, the Intercept CRL episode was before we went to Buzzsprout. That might have been bigger, but the biggest was 503 total downloads. As I speak today, four of the five weeks before Nash Tech went over 500. The Nash Tech preview week went over 600. The post FDA webcast week went over 700. And last week with Liver Healthy and the second week impact of the Nash Tech preview, we went over 800, which is just crazy. This week, despite the fact that virtually nobody downloaded Friday or Saturday because I think they were busy listening to the conference and we did not have conference episodes up, the week looks likely to be at least 700, maybe more than that. Over this time, our rolling 30 day podcast number, which we we're so proud to have to 22. 22- 50 to 2300 has been in the 25 to 2700 range. So things keep going up, which is really exciting. Thanks for listening and thanks for staying with us. And please tell your friends, we can't have too many listeners. Thanks to the Nashtag coverage team. Thanks to everyone involved in our Nashtag coverage. From Friday evening through Sunday morning, we spent seven hours recording on top of 16 hours spent in session, which did not leave a lot of time for sleeping or eating or family or much of anything else. I have some special thanks. Special thanks to Donna, who came to five sessions, and Louise, who came to four and spent her fifth administering COVID-19 vaccines to maybe 1,500 people at the Excel Center in London. Also, the co-directors who are so generous with their time and advice. Now, Stephen's always a major supporter, but Vlad and Michael each took two turns during this meeting, and Rohit was a big supporter as well. Thanks to our other guest surfers, Naeem, who got up at the crack of dawn in Utah two days in a row, Manal, who came right on after a session where she made major presentation and did some chair work, and then Ian, who gave up two afternoons, and Yorn, who gave up two weekend afternoons, including uh, right before a six-year-old birthday party for his girl so they could be here. No thanks would be complete without Mike Wilson, who proved himself magic once more by turning things around so quickly. It's really hard to get this many episodes out this fast, particularly since we had some schedule challenges and things that ran late or started late. He's been amazing. Eric, similarly, because he's provided social media support. And then finally, I really need to thank my family, including an amazingly patient and wonderful three-year-old granddaughter who understood that she needed to be quiet whenever she was working. And my wife, who gives up a bunch of her non-working hours because podcasting has a schedule all its own that doesn't align with when she works. Congratulations to Liver Healthy and, once again, NASHTAG. Congratulations are in order. First, to Liver Healthy for having the second most eight-day downloads of any episode in our short history with Buzzsprout. Again, that might not count the Intercept CRL. And then to Nashtag, whose preview episode was the most downloaded of the five conference previews we've done to date and our number four all time. Surfing Nash is covering the fourth Global Nash Congress. Surfing Nash will be covering the 5th Global Nash Congress on April 28th and 29th. It's a virtual conference, originally scheduled in London, and we will be providing more information on that over the next couple of weeks. It will probably look more like our easel ASLD coverage, less like our Nash Tech coverage, but we're still working out the details. It's a good meeting. It's got some great presentations in it in two tracks. It's more commercially oriented than academic, so that'll be a little different for us, but we're really excited about it, and we're excited and hope you'll be there with us, too. With all that said, we'll be back next Wednesday with our first non-event topic in a while. After that, we've gotten a plethora of exciting research to share and the Global Nash Congress and later in the spring, obviously, International Nash Day and Easel. We will post on Global Nash Congress during the week, perhaps, and next week we will let you know what our coverage is going to look like. Until then, I hope you all enjoyed Nash Tag. I hope you've all enjoyed our coverage. Stay safe, stay warm, or stay dry, depending upon what's going on where you are, and surf on. See you on the podcast. Bye-bye now. You've been listening to the Surfing the Nash Tsunami coverage of Nash Tag 2021. Have any questions for the surfers? You can post them on the Surfing the Nash Tsunami discussion group on LinkedIn or Facebook or send them to questions at surfingnash.com and we will attempt to answer before the end of our Nash TG coverage. Thanks for listening. See you tomorrow on the Surfing the Nash Tsunami coverage of Nash Tag 2021.